السلام عليكم ورحمة الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم انشر علينا رحمتك وأنزل علينا حكمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام uh, I know that the last session was kind of long so today we're going to take a little bit light uh, we're going to take a beautiful story about the wife of Pharaoh so we'll be talking about Asiya may Allah be pleased with her uh, as you know last time we talked about Tisa'a Ayat Allah said that we sent to Pharaoh and his people nine signs and that culminated in the parting of the sea and Pharaoh and his army being swallowed up by those waters and Musa and his people being saved and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran فَالْيَوْمَ نُنَجِّيكَ بِبَدَنِكَ لِتَكُونَ لِمَنْ خَلْفَكَ آيَةً that we are going to preserve your body for future generations and Allah mentioned that all of this وَإِذْ فَرَقَنَا بِكُمُ الْبَحْرَ how Allah caused the seas to be parted and we saved you O Bani Israel وَأَنْتُمْ تَنْظُرُونَ so all of that happened before their very eyes so it's building, 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 and there's this, you know, basically watershed moment, and then we need to see now that they have crossed the sea, what is Bani Israel going to do? We're only going to start the very beginning of that story because we'll continue it next week, inshallah. But now that we've completed this story, we want to talk about Asiya, and how is it possible that despite being married, to literally the worst human being that has ever walked the face of the earth. The worst person. Asiya was a person who the Prophet ﷺ described as having perfect iman. There are four women, as you know, that the Prophet ﷺ praised as being, uh, uh, you know, perfect paradigms, examples. Uh, for the believers and of course out of the four two are from his time um, his wife and his daughter and then in the case of the past uh, Maryam and Asiya are the two women out of the four that are mentioned now in Surah Al-Tahreem because we don't have a lot to work with in the Quran there's not a detail a lot of detail there there's some detail that we find in the hadith Allah says in ayah number 11 أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وضرب الله مثلا للذين آمنوا امرأة فرعون إذ قالت رب ابن لي عندك بيتا في الجنة ونجني ونجني من فرعون وعمله ونجني من القوم الظالمين and Allah sets forth an example for the believers the wife of Pharaoh who prayed, My Lord, build me a house in paradise near you. Deliver me from Pharaoh and his evil doing and save me from the wrongdoing people. Now, of course, we're going to get to this later, inshallah. But there's a reason here where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning her as Imra'atu Fir'aun, the wife of Pharaoh. Of course, she's Asiya bint Muzahim, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he could have just said that this is Asiya and, and she was living in the time and she was married to Pharaoh. But instead, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduces her to us as Imra'atu Fir'aun, as the wife of Pharaoh. And in the previous ayah that came right before, وَضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا لِلَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مْرَأَةَ نُوحٍ وَمْرَأَةَ لُوتٍ that Allah describes the wife of Lut and Noah, that these women are, despite being married to prophets, they became disbelievers. So they went against the grain within their relationship among their loved ones, and they made individual choices. They had their own individual struggles, and so your family is not going to save you. Right? We gave a khutbah about this last year, about Noah, that إِنَّهُ لَيْسَ مِنْ أَهْلِكْ إِنَّهُ عَمَلٌ غَيْرُ صالح. So when it came to Noah, the fact that his father is a prophet really was of no avail to him. Because when he went, he said, I'm going to, 
go to the top of the mountain يعصمني من الماء and what did Noah said? He said the mountain is going to save me and then Noah he said لا عاصم اليوم من أمر الله there's nothing that's going to save you from the command of Allah except إلا من رحم except for who Allah has mercy for so don't think that your connection, your marriage, your partnership is going to save you. It's a matter, Iman is a matter of individual choice. Now there's very little to work with in terms of her life story, even from the biblical sources, because she's praised and she's mentioned everywhere, but there's not a lot of detail. And so one of the reasons the commentator said is because, you know, these royal figures, they keep a low profile, right? So even nowadays, if you really want to find out about what they're up to, um, you know, even in a globalized world, information age, even in social media, we still don't know a lot of these figures and what their daily life is look like. But what we do know is that she was from a very wealthy, rich family. She was a very beautiful woman. She had an arranged marriage with the Pharaoh, uh, which was typical for that time. That was according to their culture and their ways. And she was always known for her generosity as being a kind-hearted and generous person. And as a generous person, she was at the Nile River with her maids and she sees a small crate. She sees a small box that is floating in the water. And when they see something in the water in this, in this nice box, they say, well, okay, well, something has been hidden in, in, in a box. It must be some kind of treasure, it must be something good. But when they open it, instead, they find a baby, right? So they find this baby who is Musa alayhi salam. And the fact that she is there or her maids are there and they receive this baby right away. How, how do we know that this baby is received right away? Remember from a few sessions ago, who is following the baby along the river? Not the mother, the sister, yes. So the mother sends the sister to follow and to see where it goes, right? Now, it, and we talked about that. We said it shows the confidence of the mother and the trust in Allah. Because, فَلْيُلْقِهِ الْيَمُّ بِالسَّاحِلِ Right? So it's mentioned that just throw the baby um, uh, in, into the water and Allah is going to take care of the rest. But in addition to trusting in Allah fully, she also takes precaution. She sends the daughter that make sure the baby is delivered and make sure everything is fine. So that combination is very hard for us as human beings. Some people become, oh, Allah is taking care of it, and they become kind of passive about things in life. And then there are other people who, who take the precautions and the means, and because they have taken the means, then they stop trusting in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the fact that you know, she's following, she probably sees from a distance, oh, the royal house, who, who would have thought that would happen, right? So she's witnessing how the divine decree is unfolding, right? And, Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also wants to put her mind at ease, to put her heart at ease, not to worry. So it was planned in such a way that Asiya would be outside at that moment, and would come and take the baby. Now when she holds this baby and looks at this baby, she falls in love with baby Musa. And this is from her fitrah. This is from her natural order. This is from her natural inclination. So there's authentic hadith from Sahih Muslim that inna al-arwaha junoodun mujannada that the souls are conscripted soldiers those man ta'arafa, so right, so those that got to know each other, if you alam al arwah in the domain of the souls, then they have a natural affinity towards each other in this world. So sometimes you meet someone and you feel close to them, you feel like they get you, they understand you, right? You have this natural connection. It could be because of that. And sometimes you love each other for the sake of Allah despite barely knowing each other. Now, of course, it can work the other way around where there's somebody who you just can't get along with, and it could be because of that. Now, there's also divine wisdom in that the fact that she was unable to have children. Uh, it's not really the topic, but I know, of course, this is a struggle uh, that has always existed. And, you know, the people 
who are unable to naturally have their own children has only been increasing the percentage, right? And so it's also a reassurance from them that this is that the best of creation had the same struggle, had the same difficulty and hardship. They overcame it and they were able to find motherhood. Other than there's not only one path, there are multiple paths to having children, right? This is, the society will tell you this is the only way, otherwise you're no good, right? But that's not the reality. Um, so there's divine wisdom in the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala perfectly calibrated everything in that way. And some of the Mufassirin, they said there's another aspect, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his infinite wisdom did not wish for Pharaoh to have the pleasure of having a child through her. Right? That Asya, because she was so pure, because she was so virtuous, and because Pharaoh was so evil, that it's not possible, or Allah did not wish that a child would come out of that union. It wasn't deserving of that. Allah knows best. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes the baby to come literally to their doorstep, and she says, well, let's keep the baby. It will be qurratu ayni li walak. It will be a source of joy. It will be the coolness of my eyes and to you. I mean, it's it's a very sweet, nice thing, very thoughtful thing. She's saying that we will we can make him like a son for us, right? And we'll raise him here, and it'll be just just you know we'll live happily ever after. What do you think Pharaoh said in response? He said something a little bit more than that. He said, yes for you. It's going to be a source of coolness uh, and joy for you, but for me, never. That's true. And th th we'll get to that in just a second. They were killing the boys, but also Pharaoh rejected him from the beginning. And some of the commentators, they said, if Pharaoh... Because she said that may he be a joy to you. But Allah before, he said, Adul, that Allah had sent him in order that he would be an enemy to Pharaoh. So when she says, may he be a source of joy to your eyes, if he had only said, Amin, then Allah would have accepted her prayer. But because he is the one that rejected that prayer, that he ended up being an enemy. So all of this happened because Pharaoh did not accept him and did not want him to be a source of happiness. So because of that reply. Now as we just mentioned that he, was, he had seen that vision, the dream, that all of the, uh, you know, there's going to be one particular baby that is going to overthrow him. And so because he had killed all of the male babies from that particular year, um, in order for that not to happen, he puts Musa through some tests to make sure that he is not capable of overthrowing him like the dream he had seen from Bani Israel that year. I mean, keep in mind, this is a baby. I mean, what does a baby know about fighting and which side it's on and even that it's from Bani Israel? Presumably, you can tell some signs that this child is from Bani Israel and not from the Coptic Christians. But we don't know that. We're kind of reading between the lines. Then Asiya alayhi salam, she dedicates herself to Musa as a mother. She raises him. She loves him as a mother. And meanwhile, they needed somebody to nurse the baby. We already talked about this. And she brings back the mother of Musa alayhi salam, not knowing um, as, as a wet nurse, not knowing that this is in fact the actual real mother. And then later on, Musa receives a nubuwa, he receives prophethood, and Pharaoh rejects that messages, those messages. And she immediately, because of her natural inclination, because of her intelligence, because of her perception, an ability to recognize the truth, she immediately believes in Tawheed, the oneness of Allah, and she starts to practice it. Now the famous incident that we do know about is the incident of al mashita the incident of the hairdresser. Now the hairdresser of the daughter of Fir'aun, 
one day she's doing, you know, she's, you know, nowadays as parents, we have to do everything, right? But in these royal families, they have one person for the water, one person for the bath, one person for the hair, right? So they have all different, different tasks, right? So there was a hairdresser taking care of the hair of the daughter of Pharaoh. And one day she was doing her hair and combing it. And so she drops the comb. And when she drops the comb, what does she say? As she's picking up the comb, she says, Bismillah, in the name of Allah. And the daughter asked the hairdresser, Oh, this is, a, so Fir'aun, he has so many wives. And he has concubines, right? But let's assume it's from another wife, right? So he did, they did not have any children at all, the two of them as a couple. Um, she was not a con she was the wife of Pharaoh, but um, it could be that he had more than one wife, right? Um, and definitely he had a daughter. So that part we know. So the daughter said, "You talk about Allah, Abi." Are you talking about my father as Allah? Is that Allah? And the hairdresser said, no. The Lord of your father. And the Lord of you and the Lord of me. And so then uh, Fir'aun, guess what? The daughter tells Fir'aun about this. And he asked the Mashifa that do you have any Lord other than me? I'm the only Lord. What other Lord can you possibly have? And the hairdresser says, My Lord and your Lord and the Lord of everything. And he doesn't hesitate. Once he hears this, he has no mercy. He orders for a huge pit to be dug, for it to be filled with copper, so she and her children, because as a mother, that's the worst thing for you to witness, would be thrown in front of everyone. His goal was not to punish her. His goal was to make an example of her, right? A, a kind of deterrence against anyone else from challenging him. But in the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does he do with, his, with Pharaoh's body? He does exactly the same thing. Pharaoh wanted to punish her, so everybody would say, oh, don't do what she did. But in the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, نُنَجِّيكَ بِبَدَنِكَ so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes an example out of him. So now he is a sign and a deterrent for other people. So the very thing that he tried to do to other people it ended up happening to him. And Fir'aun, he knows that the hardest thing for a mother is to see her children suffer. It just pulls and tugs at the heartstrings. And what they do is they, after they have seized her, they barge into her house and they find that the children are crying for their mother because they know what's happened to her, that she's been taken and she's held by Pharaoh and now they've taken the children as well. She is helpless to help them and they're helpless to help her. And meanwhile, she can end all of the suffering if she would just back down. If she would just change one word and she said, no, no, I, I made a mistake, I got confused then all of that, that whole nightmare would just come to an end. But the woman instead, she says, I have a request that whenever you finish burning us, that you gather all of our bones together in one cloth. This is out of her love for her children. And Pharaoh, he promises her, he says, your request will be honored. That after we've burned, after we've been melted and burnt to a crisp, that you take all of our bones and you wrap us together. Let us always, you know, we were together in life, we should be together in death as well. Now she started to be thrown into boiled oil and she perished, she died. The other children died first and then it was just her and the newborn baby, the young baby that was, that was nursing. And she hesitated and the baby spoke to her. And there's a hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu that there were three babies that spoke, right? Of course, we know Jesus, one out of the three, that spoke to the mother and she told her mother that go ahead and jump into it. And so the baby spoke that jump in, throw me, because the punishment in this world is a lot less and it's a lot lighter 
than the torture and the punishment of the afterlife. And so she takes this baby and she jumps with the baby. She doesn't like fall in. She jumps in into this pit. And when the Prophet ﷺ is on the journey of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj, he reaches, you guys know the story, right? He goes from heaven. He goes from heaven to heaven and he reaches the seventh heaven. When the Prophet, I mean, this is, right? This is like at the very top levels of Jannah, he reaches the seventh level. What does he experience? He experiences the most beautiful aromas. And he starts to ask Jibreel that this is in Sahih Muslim also, a different hadith, but in Muslim. And he asks Jibreel that what is this beautiful scent? And Jibreel says, This is the scent of Al Mashifa. This is the scent of the hairdresser of the daughter of Fir'aun in Al Jannah. That because of how beautiful her life was, her commitment and faith, how strong her faith was. So now she's in the seventh level of Al Jannah. And this is the nature of the believers. That when you come to them and you said that that people have gathered against you, that the forces have been assembled, there are armies that are approaching, there's cruelty that abounds. Then their iman, rather than decreasing, rather than fear taking place of hope, their iman, it increases. They only have more faith. Now, who's watching all of this transpire? Because this, this is about the hairdresser, but we're talking about Asiya. Asiya, she witnesses the cruelty of Fir'aun. She saw the courage of that woman. And what did it do to her faith? She became even more courageous. It increased her iman. And Asiya, she started to ask herself in her heart. She says, you know what? If Fir'aun is like this, and he is this tyrant, and this innocent woman has the audacity, <coughs> she has the guts to stand up to him and have that courage, then you know what? I'm also going to do the same. I'm going to have the courage to go up to him, to stand up to Pharaoh and to declare the truth. So she walks up to Pharaoh that night and she says, Oh Pharaoh, I have disbelieved in you. I don't care what you're going to do. I know that you're going to threaten me. I know that you're going to punish me. I know you're going to make an example of me. I already know all of that and I do not care. And I believe in the Lord of Musa and the Lord of Harun and the Lord of all of the world. Those are the words that he really hated. And Pharaoh, he is shocked. And he said, don't you know what I'm going to do to you? And again, she said, I know, but I really don't care. I have disbelieved in you. I have rejected you. And her iman was perfected. She affirmed the truth. You would think that Pharaoh, this is his beloved wife. Remember he had taken in, in Musa, he didn't really want to. Why did he do that? Because he wanted to please his wife. He wanted to make her happy, right? He said, I don't like the baby. So it wasn't because he liked the baby. He did it because it was something that his wife wanted. But Fir'aun, in this case, could not care about her at all. Fir'aun, he drags out Asiya. And you have to understand that Asiya, she had lived her entire life as a queen. She never encountered any adversity. She never had any inconvenience. She has never even had to lift a finger. She's coming from an elite family in an arranged marriage. And... She's come of age, and before she knows, she's married to Pharaoh. Anything she wanted in life, she tells her maids to do it, and they take care of it. But here she is, and now Pharaoh is dragging her into the desert. He ties her down. He tortures her. He deprives her of water, deprives her of food, deprives her of her dignity, her honor, and strips his own wife and the daughter of Pharaoh from the other wife, the one that reported this in the first case, 
What is she doing? She's laughing at her. She's getting joy out of this. She's happy to see her suffer. All of the other people in the royal court, all of the people that pretended to be her friend, to care about her, no single human being there is supporting her. No one is there that's loving her. Why? Because Musa alayhi salam is not present. And her maids, they don't want to be killed. Self-preservation kicks in. And so they remain completely silent. And they don't oppose Pharaoh because there's nothing that the maids can do. And while this is going on and she's being tortured, she looks up into the heaven and she says, Rabbi, Oh Allah, Oh my Lord, build for me with you a palace in Al Jannah. Rabbi bini li bayta. What a beautiful dua and so beautifully constructed. Rabbi bini li, build for me عندك. We'll talk about that in a moment. With you in Al Jannah. I want to be with you. In this world, my company was with Pharaoh. I was stuck with him. But in the afterlife, I want to be with you, Ya Allah. I want to be in your company. And you see this palace that everybody told me is the most important thing in the world and I should be happy with what I have and this is the best house in the world and I'm so lucky to be me and everybody else is jealous of me because I live in the palace and this is the best house but it's not a home. So, oh Allah, replace this palace that I've sacrificed for you with a house in Al-Jannah, with a palace in Al-Jannah. And where should this palace be? Indaka. And she mentions that first, that I asked for a palace in Jannah before she even asked for Jannah. Rabbi bini li indaka baytan fil Jannah. The very last part that she mentions is that this house should be in Al Jannah. The part that she emphasizes that she mentions first is that I ask you for your company. She asks for Allah's company. And, it, and if you think about it, she's talking about leaving her husband, Pharaoh. So one person would think, oh, Allah, replace this husband. She doesn't say replace this husband with another husband. Because she's concerned with her akhirah. So uh, Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, he wrote in the commentary, that talabat kawna al-bayti andahu qabla talabiha an yakuna fil jannah. So she mentions that she wants the house should be with Allah. And that comes first. Before she mentions that the house should be in Al-Jannah. So it's like that's the minor point. The important point is I want the house that's next to you. Because فَإِنَّ الْجَارِ قَبْلَ الدَّارِ Because the neighbor matters more than the house itself, right? So the location in the neighborhood is secondary. The first thing that you need to look at is who you're living with. Okay. Torture hasn't ended. This is still happening. She's making this dua. And the people, the workers for that slave after Fir'aun, they're lashing her over and over again. And now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent down the angels that are shading her, protecting her. And so as she's being tortured, she's looking up. And what does she see? She sees that she's shaded, and so she starts to laugh. And Pharaoh says to the guards, look how crazy this woman is. She's losing her mind. We're torturing her, and she's laughing. And she laughed, and she laughed, and she laughed, and she's smiling. And people think, wow, she's really lost it. And what, what is this doing to Pharaoh? It's making him even more angry. He's losing his mind. He's getting crazy. And he says, you know what? This woman has lost it. She's not going to come back to her senses. We need to change tactics. Go to the highest cliff and tie her under there. So put her at the bottom of the cliff. 
Then find the biggest boulder that you can find and push that huge boulder off the cliff and that will fall onto her and that will crush her body into pieces. And so they go up to that cliff and they push the boulder to fall onto the body of Asya. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deprive Pharaoh of the pleasure of having killed her. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed that he was not the one that did so. When they came to her, Allah caused the sky to widen and to open. And before she departed from this earth, she was able to see from the heaven her house in Al-Jannah. She was able to visualize it. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then took her soul when she said, وَنَجِّنِي مِنْ فِرْعَوْنَ وَعَمَلِهِ وَنَجِّنِي مِنُ الْقَوْمِ الظَّالِمِينَ When she said that, save me from Pharaoh as in his evil, what did she mean? She meant, allow me to die. So that way I don't have to experience this at his hands. So Allah took her soul before the boulder. So as they're throwing the boulder, Allah causes her soul to depart. And she dies before the moment of the boulder crushing her body. So when people saw that her body was shattered into a million different pieces, they thought that Pharaoh had killed her. But in fact, that's not true. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had taken her for himself. And Allah had given her a place in Al-Jannah as she requested. Now she's one of the four greatest women, as we mentioned, and she was khayru nisa'iha. She was the best of all women in her time. And this is the opposite of Pharaoh. Lama أَغْرَقَ اللَّهُ فِرْعَوْنَ قَالَ آمَنْتُ بِأَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا الَّذِي آمَنَتْ بِهِ بَنُ إِسْرَائِيلُ فَقَالَ جِبْرِيلُ So in the moment when Pharaoh is being drowned, then he says, I have believed in the one that Bani Israel have believed in. And then Jibreel says, Ya Muhammad, falaw ra'aytani. So Jibreel is telling the Prophet about where he was at that moment. And he said, if only you had seen me, وَنَآخِذُ مِنْ حَالِ الْبَحْرِ فَأَدُسُّهُ فِي فِيهِ مَخَافَةَ أَنْ تُدْرِكَهُ الرَّحْمَةِ So he said that if only you could have seen me when I was taking the mud out of the sea and filling his mouth out of fear that the mercy would reach him. Now some people, they have read too much into this hadith because they said, is Jibreel trying to stop him from believing? Or is it like, if he had only said that, then he would have, no, no, no. Everything happens according to Allah's permission. Don't be confused, right? He doesn't, uh, Jibreel is saying that out of frustration and anger with uh, Fir'aun trying to manipulate the system and, you know, right at the closing bell, sneak it in, the, the shahada. But as we know from the Qur'an, Allah rejected it because it wasn't real and it wasn't genuine and because it was too late. But out of fear that there was some rahmah, some mercy that could have reached him. Okay, so some lessons. There are some lessons in here about sacrifice. Look at her willingness to give up every single thing that she holds for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She has an illuminated heart. She has basira. There's apparent sight and there is hidden sight. Now also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout the Quran praises people who are independent thinkers. This is very important. Because she's going against society, she's going against her husband. She is not defined by her status and her circumstance. It teaches us that we shouldn't blame our uh, community and our society. We shouldn't blame others. That you have choice, you have power, you have agency, and you can decide your own fate. That only you can make the decisions that are going to affect you. Now she's also patient and she's strong. And she's very tenacious. And this teaches us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take care of you. <laughs> that if you protect the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then he is going to protect you. Now, of course, one of the greatest lessons is that she chose the akhirah over the dunya. That she chose that which is everlasting. Al-Hasan al-Basri, rahimahullah, he said, sell this life for the next one, and you will win both of them. 
People who only work for the Akhirah, are they, do they lose anything from the dunya? No. In fact, they end up having more joy and more happiness as a result of being focused in the Akhirah. But if you sell the next life for this one, then you end up وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِي فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً ضَنْكَ وَنَحْشُرُهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَعْمَى So what ends up happening is you have a miserable existence over here and you have, of course, a more miserable existence in the Akhirah. There's another lesson here that a husband has personal accountability, the wife has personal accountability. They are two separate people. You don't have to be defined by your spouse, right? Sometimes people are held down, held back because, you know, I'm interested in this, my husband, he doesn't want to do it, you know, I want to go for Hajj, you know. Find ways, you know, uh, and, and, don't, and don't allow religion to be a source of conflict. People, I, I see all the time people argue about religion, right, between parents and kids and siblings and husband and wife. A, a religion is not there for, for you to argue with people, okay? That doesn't make any sense. So you don't need, just live your religion. You don't need to be preachy and, and, and trying to force people to do what you're doing. If you embody that example, if you live that example by action, then they're going to see that and they'll be affected by it automatically, inshallah. Now, why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Imra'atu Fir'aun, the woman of Pharaoh, and doesn't say, what's the word? Well, well, let's back up. In Arabic, how do you say wife? Zawja, or in the classical Arabic, Zawj. So the wife of Pharaoh, you would say that the wife, Zawj, right? And we know, وَخَلَقَنَاكُمْ azwaja. Allah says we have created you in pairs. So the word for wife comes from the word spouse, from the word pair. So why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Imra'atu Fir'aun, and not Zawj of Fir'aun? Because are they a pair? I mean, in worldly terms, they're married. They're married, right? But why are they not a pair? What is it about them that prevents them from being real spouses? Right? Because of their religion, of course. But even before getting into religion, just in, in worldly matters, they're not on the same page. She, he's going in one direction, and she's going in another direction. I mean, to put it simple, he's evil and she's good. I mean, that's why they're not on the same page. So in order for you to be pairs, this is the subtle, this is the balagh of the Qur'an, that why Allah used this word, he didn't use that other word. There's so much that you can learn from the Qur'an. Allah didn't describe them as a, as a wife, not because she wasn't his wife, because they weren't on the same page. And so because of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't want to elevate their relationship by describing it that way. And, and as a very subtle point, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout the Qur'an uses the story of women. There are many women in the Qur'an that are mentioned. Of course, you know, the majority view among the scholars is that all of the prophets were men although it's not been authentically stated to us about that, that has been the majority position. It's permissible to disagree with that because, of course, this is just a kind of opinion or ijtihad. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout the Qur'an weaves in these beautiful stories of strong women. And one of the reasons that I think Allah has done that is to show a very subtle point that there is a moral leadership of women. Because when he talks about the men, usually Allah emphasizes social leadership, right? So Musa, he's the leader of Bani Israel. And next week, inshallah, we'll talk about فَنْفَجْرَتْ مِنْ هُتْنَتَا عَشْرَةَ عَيْنَا about how there are 12 branches. Now, what 12 branches are these? These are the sons. So then you can come to the conclusion, oh, everything is about the men, everything is about the sons, and the women are not important. But that's not the case at all. Because the social leadership may be with the men, but the moral leadership, right? So the uprightness within the society 
in many, many cases is actually defined by strong women, including the example of Asia, and they provide moral leadership for society. Okay, now for the last point for today, um, back to Bani Israel. Where is Bani Israel at that moment? Where did we end last week? I got a cliffhanger, right? Where, where's Bani Israel? They crossed the sea. They literally, they're on the other side. Let's assume it's the Red Sea, right? The Quran seems to imply that it's the Red Sea, even though it's not stated. In the, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, it's mentioned the Sea of Reeds, right? Which could be a little bit more towards the Gulf of Aqaba. Uh, so if I put the two together, let's assume that it's, it's the Gulf of Aqaba towards Jordan. It could be somewhere in the Nile Delta, but I don't think that makes sense. But there are different theories about that. But they have crossed the sea. And they have walked away from seeing Pharaoh and his army. More than a million troops. All wiped out into the sea. All drowned. They saw something that almost no one has ever seen in the past. And something that will never ever be repeated. And will never be seen in history again. And as soon as they have crossed, what do they encounter? They encounter another tribe of people. So they've crossed the sea, they start walking, they start moving, they're in the desert. Before you know it, they have encountered another tribe. And in Surah Al A'raf, in Ayah 138, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, فَأَتَوْا عَلَىٰ قَوْمِ يَعْكُفُونَ عَلَىٰ أَصْنَامٍ لَهُمْ قَالُوا يَا مُوسَ جَعَلْ لَنَا إِلَهًا كَمَا لَهُمْ آلِهًا قَالَ إِنَّكُمْ قَوْمٌ تَجَهَلُونَ We brought the children of Israel across the sea and they came upon a people devoted to idols. They demanded, O oh Moses, they have one, can we have one too? Make for us a God like their gods. He replied, indeed, you are a people acting ignorantly. I mean, this is crazy. They just saw probably the greatest miracle in human history. They walked away safe and sound. And now you want to go from Allah who has saved you and you want to replace him with an idol that you're going to make with your own hands. I mean, how stupid is that? How ridiculous is that? I mean, did you just forget what you witnessed and what you saw? But he's so patient. He should have said, like, you, you guys are terrible, you're the worst. But what does he say? Qawman tajahaloon. You're being ignorant. He's so patient with them. Inna ha'ula'i mutabbarun ma'hum fihi wa ba'atinun ma'kanu ya'maloon. What they follow is certainly doomed to destruction and their deeds are in vain. So... Now we have, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention that story immediately after they were saved? In order for us to realize from the very beginning that Moses, that Moses has his work cut out for him. That Bani Israel is going to give him a very, very hard time. They're not going to leave him with any wiggle room. Every time that he gives them any bit of slack, they're going to make it really difficult for him. Next week, inshallah, we're going to talk about their journey through the desert and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quenches their thirst and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has favored Bani Israel. This is one of the realities is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala faddalahum, right? Allah, he says that I have favored you over all of the people. But why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done that and what are the implications of that, what does that mean? Does it mean we are God's chosen people? No, right? So the, it, it, the lesson that we can benefit and we can extract from that is something very, very different, inshallah. So I hope this is beneficial for everyone. This is a story that we really need to share in our homes with our daughters. They should understand because oftentimes they think that all the prophets, they think it's just Moses, they think it's just Ibrahim, they know about the Anbiya, but they don't know about the women that are mentioned within the Quran and given so much importance. So we hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can 
bring us close to their example and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can bless us and our families. Okay, let's open up the discussion, inshallah. Anybody want to get us, get us going? Assalamu alaikum. So uh, during uh, Asiyah's or uh, Firam's time, um, Musa already left when he killed the, that person. Yeah. And just now you mentioned that uh, the dresser of the daughter, uh, when the comb fell down, she said, Bismillah. Uh, how come this idea of Allah or, uh, because there was no prophet at that time, in Asia, for example, in Asia, believing in Allah, or dresser believing in Allah, and there was no messenger who told about, mentioned about Allah. How about, how come they came to know all about Allah? Or, um, because sure. there was no Musa also, there was no prophet at that time. And Asia was already saying Allah or believing in Allah. So the, the way that we understand that most likely this happened is that it happened after Musa had come back. So Musa, as you know, he had spent more than 10 years. So let's say, you know, 12, 13 years, whatever it is, that he had been in Median, and then he finally comes back to Egypt. When he comes back, he comes back as a prophet. And he starts to preach to people about Tawheed, about the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the initial phase, Pharaoh has not, you know, he's kind of, uh, non-threatening, right? So Pharaoh hasn't uh, seized him, he hasn't done anything to him, and then he starts to gather followers, but it seems like nobody's listening to him, because publicly, how many followers does he have? None, right? Even Bani Israel, they are not exposing the fact that they're believing him, and if there are any few believers from the Coptic um, uh, people, Egyptian people, they're not saying it publicly. So the mashifa, the, the hairdresser, is one of those people who were hiding their faith and uh, nobody realized that they were followers of Musa when he came Musa back. already has told them about Allah or about uh, the uh, religion. Right, but it could be that this happened before the incident with the snakes mm. and before the magicians. Allah knows best, I don't mm. know the exact timeline, but this is most likely going to be very early when Musa comes back and he starts to preach that he's a prophet and Asiya has already become Muslim and her faith was not exposed but the incident with the hairdresser made Asiya have more courage to confront Pharaoh and to say well I believe in this too. Right. So this uh, about the women mentioned in Quran uh -huh. like Asiya, like Maryam and who else is who, whose names are mentioned in Quran? The women, I mean. Uh, there are so many. I mean, Khatija. Uh, Sarah is mentioned, Hajar is mentioned, Khatija. Maryam is mentioned, um, uh, Asiya is mentioned. Um, the, we, we said Sarah already. We have uh, a lot of the mothers of uh, Zakaria and Yahya. Uh, so there, there there are maybe like probably about one dozen women that are mentioned in the Quran. Thank yeah. you. So there, there are plenty, alhamdulillah. Uh, and we, we've been, actually we've spoken about most of them. Yes. Right? As we yeah. go along, we usually try to mention their stories in connection with the Anbiya and the Prophets. We have a question here. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Please clarify, it was the same Pharaoh who saved and raised Musa alayhi salam and the one who tortured Asiya. So this couple had moments of good and moments of evil, which speaks to domestic violence. Is there some literature about this concerning this couple? Yeah, this is an important angle. Uh, two, there are really two questions in here. So uh, that's true. There's a bit of a contradiction because in the past I had promoted my thought, which is that it was two different pharaohs. But in the classical tafsir literature, they treated that it's the same pharaoh. So the question is pending. It, we, we haven't resolved it. I think that it's two different pharaohs. But the way that I gave the story today, 
suggest that it's one pharaoh because that's what's in the classical um, the classical literature. Um, and so there's a question there as to whether it is. And then actually when we look at a lot of the hieroglyphics and the literature, we know that from that time period that there's a change that Ramses <coughs> the second kind of seizes control and he's a military leader. He has like 15, 20 different expeditions. And so there's a possibility that there's a change over that happens relatively quickly. So I think that leads us to believe that there is a time gap. And so now we're at the very, very end of that Pharaoh's demise. So when that Pharaoh is torturing Asiya alayhi salam, then, she is, then he is still the Pharaoh. But right after this story happens, then either he dies or he's removed from power and the new Pharaoh comes in, right? And so he's like evil at the time, but not the same person and not the same evil of the Pharaoh that's going to come. That is the one that is the Pharaoh of Musa. That is the second one. But it doesn't change anything in the story in any way. But this couple has moments of good and moments of evil that speaks to domestic violence. I think, you know, uh, if we want to look at it from that lens of DV, of domestic violence, really it's about, it's about uh, control, right? That's, that's what happens in couples that have this cycle. And we see this within the Quran, that uh, Pharaoh is, um, he kind of goes through this cycle in which it's, yeah, there are moments of good, but it has to be on his terms, right? And the same way with the evil, the reason that he goes that direction is because he is trying to enforce his authority, his possession, and his power over him, over her. And so as a result of that, she's in a situation which most people would feel that they're stuck, that they won't have the strength to stand up to him. But Asiya, by having this story in the Quran, it encourages somebody that's in a difficult situation to stand up to the one who's oppressing them and to assert their own agency and their own choice. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I saw your clip on YouTube, I mean, it's just a different topic. Okay. Do you aware of that? I mean, are you doing or somebody else is doing? Uh, we have uh, one of our sisters, Sister Mayim, she posts on... So, is it more, more than one or two? What's that? Is it more than one or two, or is it going to be serious, the clips? I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, but they were nice. I mean, I, I like it. I mean, okay. it, it, the one you just mentioned, uh, add that one too. I mean, and they need more. Alhamdulillah. Inshallah, yeah. we'll Yeah, that, that, that was a great. I mean, it's, it's going to collect a little money too, I guess. <laughs> it's going to benefit. Not even I see. Famous yet, but. Yeah. No, I mean, they keep doing it. Was, it was great because I watch it. I spend like half hour a day or 15, 20 minutes. I mean, it's well value. Well, because it's got all kind of information comes in little by little, couple of minutes, two no minutes. So, okay. so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that was great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, that's all I have. Um, okay. So we have a question from Yasin. Would you know what happened to the people who were after Musa, peace be upon him, because he killed that person? It sounded like they didn't come after him when he came back. So, um, you know, the other thing about Musa is that when he, when he, you know, the case is still kind of pending, right? It's an accusation because the, the man had said, uh, you know, Ataptulani, are you going to kill me? Kama qatalta nafsan bil ams, right? As you killed somebody yesterday. So the circumstances haven't really been investigated because the whole legal system, their whole, you know, uh, criminal justice system is rigged. So it's not really a fair process, it's not really a fair, a fair system, but he had mentioned that I fear that they're going to kill me because I'm wanted, right? I'm on the most wanted list, right? So the question about whether they came after him when he came back for that, I don't know, but I know that that was something that he feared would happen or could happen, but as to whether it actually did happen or whether it had an impact, on him spreading the message. I think that they did have a bias against him because of that. 
but really what transpired as a result of that, uh, we don't really know. Um, so Sister Shana is asking which clips. So I think what we've been doing is on uh, Instagram and Facebook, uh, we've been posting short videos, right? And uh, on YouTube shorts, I think we'll start to post inshallah as well on the social media platforms. They're one minute videos. So these are little nuggets, inshallah, that are taken from these khataras, taken from the Jumar Khutbah, from uh, Dr. Tarek's talks and myself. And the reason is they're in bite size. So you hear 45 seconds, 60 seconds, and you're able to benefit that one point and then continue with your day. Okay, inshallah. Which languages do we need? Any? Yeah, inshallah, we can. That's true, that's true. Yeah, subhanAllah. I mean, we even, we see, like, we see the statistics of who's watching our videos on YouTube, and it's, it's interesting because a lot of it are, like, repeat people from, like, other states. So they just, I guess in their local masjid, they don't have these kind of classes. So they just start, they just start subscribing and they start watching it. And it's as if they're here. So alhamdulillah, it's a blessing. That's true. I should do that, guys. Every time we have a, a lecture, I should be like and subscribe. <laughs> inshallah. 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 I think these are all very valuable suggestions. We're going to go step by step. We're trying not to, you know, we want to keep it authentic, but at the same time, we want to be accessible as well, inshallah. That's right. This is really good. Actually, I mean, uh, to not to like um, toot our own horn, I guess. But I think that there really is no... I cannot think of another masjid that has the kind of classes that we have. I mean, we are taking directly... We're not taking from the tafsirs that you grab, that you get online. I mean, we're taking from a tafsir al-Ghazi, Al-Baydawi, I mean, we're taking from the most advanced tafsir texts, and I'm trying to extract, be selective, I'm not throwing everything at you, right, because it's going to be too much. And then Dr. Tariq, he's teaching you from the Shifa, and then we're teaching about Islamic history, and we're teaching from the Hikam of Ibn Ata'illah, which is an intermediate text on spirituality, um, even though it's, it's meant for the general public. Um, it's very, very rare that a masjid is going to be teaching these topics in such a you know, detailed way. And it's, this is a testament to our community, thanks to you, because all of you are interested in learning about it. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. And somebody should realize it. Yes, alhamdulillah. This is a blessing. I mean, we, we, we feed off of each other. Alhamdulillah, we're able to do this thanks to all of you. Um, and some people want it. Some people, they want to learn. They want to explore. And other people, they're like, I just want to do my basics. And that's fine too. Alhamdulillah. But we should realize that um, it's, it's a beautiful thing that you have access to this. You can listen to it on your commute. This is what I always tell people because I think YouTube is a video. I mean, there's not, <laughs> I mean I'm not doing any song or dance here, right? So you can, <laughs> you can just listen to it as you're driving or you're going somewhere hear the audio, you don't have to really watch the video, and you can catch up on your days that you're, that you're stuck in traffic. I usually don't. I have it, it's in my notes. But why do I not do that? Because you're going to say, oh, Abu Huraira reported from this person, and then uh, in ash shamail At-Tirmidhi, it says this, and then we get bogged down with footnotes. But what I do know, and I think you guys have noticed this, is that when the hadith is not authentic, I tell you that. I tell, some, some people, they only tell you authentic. Other people, they mix it all together. My style is whenever I'm telling you something which I'm not sure about, I let you know. So that way, if you want to research it more, you can check it out. But if it's authentic, I don't go into the citation because it's, 
you know, it's already authentic, so there's no need for you to look any further. <laughs> okay. Inshallah. Alhamdulillah. Okay. Well, this is a good conclusion, inshallah. We need more manpower. We need more support. The food festival is coming up. We have a lot of activities. So we need all hands on deck on Friday. We need people helping with the food. So if you're interested, you want to be part of our team and help us uh, at ICCP, we can really benefit from that. Then we can do things like that. Because putting subtitles, I have put subtitles in videos. It's a whole day thing. It's very, very difficult to put subtitles. But if somebody wants to help, then we can do it, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us. May Allah in these blessed days of Rabi'ul Awwal uh, illuminate our hearts with the example and the model of the best of creation, our beloved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and protect and preserve the ummah and all of those that are suffering throughout the world and our friends and our families and all of our loved ones. Heal those that are sick by the power of the Qur'an and forgive all of those who have passed away by the power of the Qur'an and raise us with the Qur'an and resurrect us in the afterlife with the shafa'a and the intercession of the Qur'an and your beloved messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa salli allahumma wa sallim ala nabina wa hadidina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in